as we gather together here. Uh, we wanted to ask, uh, before we got started, get a good, good perspective. You know, the goal for this panel is really to help folks understand strategy. Help, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of great talks at the conference. Uh, there's a lot more on the agenda that have to do with tools, specific aspects of how to get uh, tactical things done, how to build out and, uh, and use new types of technologies. A lot of what we're trying to get at here with this panel and the intelligent data access control concepts is what's the long-term vision that we're trying to get at, particularly for those of us who protect enterprises, uh, who are dealing with high-value systems, uh, complicated systems, systems that are often supporting different business lines, multiple business lines, thousands of users, uh, and real capabilities. So uh, one of the things we wanted to do was uh, bring together a diversity of folks from uh, different industries with different backgrounds and the uh, different elements and how they support folks. Um, so we're going to do a short introduction here uh, for each of us. I'm going to start myself. My name is Mark McGovern. I'm the founder of a local security company called Mobile System 7. We work uh, helping enterprises deal with um, mobile technologies, obviously, and protecting sensitive data. So my background is working for the last 20 some odd years helping large enterprises, including the U.S. intelligence community, U.K. National Lottery, um, Pfizer, Microsoft, and others adopt new capabilities to secure their data. Prior to founding the company that I lead today, I led uh, security investments for InQtel, which is the investment arm of the U.S. intelligence community. I led their security investments for the past nine and a half years. So uh, I'll be taking it from the perspective of, uh, one, moderating the panel and, and helping uh, guide us through our path here. Uh, and two, sort of, what, what does uh, someone who's trying to build a product or someone who's trying to build out technologies bring to the table and what are they thinking about and how do they drive advances that we want to see in the long run? So uh, if we start uh, here with Craig. Sure. Uh, how you doing? Uh, my name is Craig Rosen. Um, I work for a large utility in California called Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, we have about 9 million customers, gas and electric. Uh, 20,000 employees, um, pretty diverse enterprise, um, mobile workforce, things like tree trimmers, pole climbers, things like that. Um, and we also have lots of uh, bright new shiny things that uh, uh, want to come into our environment um, now and, and uh, in the future with things like smart grid. So um, my role in the company, um, I'm the director of technology risk and strategy, which uh, is a fancy word for I'm the translator between the business um, and the technology side for security. So. Um, I often call myself the so what guy. Um, so when we talk to the business, you know, we sit with them and I say, um, you know, here's, you know, here are these assessments and things that, that um, you know, we need to actually um, fix or, or, or uh, remediate. And, and they look at me and they say, so what? And um, I have to uh, answer that question obviously with data um, and kind of talk about the aspects of risk. So again, I'm the translator. Um, happy to be here to talk about access controls today. Uh, certainly something that um, we are trying to deal with strategically, um, and uh, we look forward to the discussion. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Bigman. Um, I have a uh, large company of two people, myself and my wife. Uh, she's the business end. I'm the uh, computer security consulting. Um, I'm the former uh, chief information security officer at CIA, uh, where uh, identity management was one of 273 things that kept me up at night. Uh, but was at the very, certainly was at the very top. Um, I spent many years uh, working the whole identity management issue from a local and from a strategic perspective, trying to make it work across multiple applications, on multiple desktops, uh, trying to recognize different users with different characteristics. Uh, it's something that um, we were laughing. I said of my 30 years at the agency, I probably spent one year attending meetings and conferences just talking about identity management. Uh, it was that much. It was that important to us, and took that much time. So I'm also very, very interested in uh, eventually seeing this problem solved. That's what really would be great. So, thank you. Hi, uh, my name's uh, I'm David Ferriolo. I'm the I'm the group manager of uh, Secure Systems and Applications Group, and at um, the at NIST in the Computer Security Division. Um, I've, uh, I, so my uh, perspective is a little bit different maybe from these other gentlemen in that I've been doing research pretty much my entire, my entire career. Uh, I started off at, at, um, at NSA in 1983 at the Computer Security Center and, and, uh, and dealt with access control, access control issues. 
I went to uh, the, the, the private sector for, for a few years and uh, developed app, um, DOD applications that implemented various forms of access control. And since I've been at NIST since 1990, I've been uh, exclusively doing research in, uh, in, in access control. Um, some of my origins of interest started in, at, at NIST with role-based access control. We like to think that maybe we had something to do with its appearance and standardization and, and deployment. Um, um, but I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm just an ivory tower guy because what we often do is we don't only develop uh, um, access control models and concepts, but we often develop uh, reference implementations. Um, we do pilot deployments, and, uh, and one of our big motivations is technology transfer. We believe that if you develop a technology and it's never used, it didn't, it didn't do anybody any good from the very beginning. So we heard identity mentioned, role-based access control mentioned, some elements of the diversity of the types of things that are happening mobile and such. Um, where I'd like to start the panel and where we're going to go is we're going to talk about some of what the importance of this problem is, what's the problem we face today, uh, some of the historical aspects of what we've tried to do in the past to change things, and then um, we're all about making this thing move forward, right? So we want to move on to what are the things that both the audience can do and what some of the panel members have done to already put in place uh, some open source capabilities and open source program. Uh, to lead the idea of how do we improve on uh, the access controls of today. But, I mean, if I look back now and I look at the problem, is, isn't it enough that we have, if we had strong authentication today with role-based access controls, is that not enough to, to address the problems that we face today? Is that? Next questions to me? Sure. Um, no, actually not, not, not even close. Uh, um, so role-based access control was a big, um, well, it was an advancement from um, prior to role-based access control. Um, most access control was based on low-level access control mechanisms like access control lists. Access control lists are very difficult to, uh, uh, to administer because typically the problem is when someone comes into your organization, you want to know what capabilities or what functions they can implement in the, in the organization. So access control lists are actually the opposite of that. So role-based access control provided a way of visualizing and managing access control data um, in a way that naturally reflects how organizations work and functions. But the problem with role-based access control, even though it's a step forward, is that everything isn't based on roles. There's other characteristics that, you, that users have. It might be that you, you're, a, you're a teller and you can only have access to certain, um, to certain information within, within your branch. So there's many other attributes or characteristics that come into play that role-based access control doesn't, doesn't um, capture. Also, role-based access control on the user side is nice because what you can do is, when you, once, if, you, if you're able to do role engineering and define these roles, when someone comes into your organization, you just assign them to their appropriate roles, and instantaneously that gives them access to their, 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 their uh, capabilities. If they change functions, you can remove their, their assignment and, and reassign it somewhere else. On the object side, it's a little bit more difficult because when you publish data and you want to share that data, role-based access control isn't an ideal um, paradigm for, for, for that, for that per perspective. So again, due to the, there's a large variety of access control policies that need to be taken into consideration. Role-based access control doesn't address, um, doesn't address all of them. But again, it was a, an important advancement and I think it did um, contribute to uh, to access control uh, um, science mm -hmm. um, and over, and it's probably about um, 15 years old now, and I, I think there's other models that are on the horizon. Bob? So, right, I, I think, Mark, um, two things. Number one, the, the issue of what is, is the problem solved and why, why is it working? The problem is identity management and authorization is directly tied to the level of um, uh, integrity you feel about the device the person came from, right? You can't separate what the person was doing or where they came from, what they were using from their identity. And today the problem is, here we are, how many, 20 something years later after uh, Novell first actually did AD, we still rely on people in groups to determine whether we have a give them access to things or not. Uh, we have amazing technology in so many fields, but access management today is still largely, here's a SID, here's an AD, Okay, do what you want with them. Um, 
it doesn't work that way. You know, in my agency, I had to worry about um, not only who they were, I had to worry about where they were at that specific time, were they coming from uh, a facility in uh, McLean, Virginia, or were they coming from Peruzzi Street out in Tehran, Iran? That makes a big difference as to whether you're going to give them access to certain things or not. But commercial systems don't do that. And I've, I, you know, when you talk about role-based access, unless someone can tell me when I don't know a commercial or open source capability that actually works well. Um, we've tried certain ones before, but frankly, they tend to miss the mark and don't make the don't don't make what the manufacturer. Miss, uh, they, they don't really satisfy what the uh, manufacturer told you they're going to do. So, um, yeah, I, I'm still very pessimistic about uh, where we're at with uh, access controls. Um, so my thoughts on this are, um, I mean, they're just way too static, right? So um, having an access control list in an environment that we're dealing with that's so dynamic, not just from the changing business needs, but from the threat environment, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, 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 we have uh, things like call center technologies changing dramatically. Um, so, you know, uh, where you would think that there would be a call center of, you know, 30 or 40 people sitting there waiting for calls anymore, this whole environment's going mobile, right? So, um, you know, perhaps they want to be in a certain place, uh, you know, at a certain time. And there's lots of different variables that are coming into this that need to be evaluated that a static list is not going to be flexible enough to change that quickly and, and you know, account for that situation. So we're seeing just complex changes in the business that are really, really pushing the need for us to go well beyond just role-based access controls. So role-based access controls brought out in the early 90s, David? 92. So 92. Uh, so we're looking at a technology that's 20-some odd years old. Uh, and sure, we've made use of it. It's gotten very complex. I think how many folks in the audience actually uh, are involved in uh, setting policies or helping folks in enterprises figure out how to secure their systems based on uh, different components of technologies, right? So how many people think that the role-based access control capabilities that they've got today really reflect a usable system that adapts as they need new technologies or new granular access? Is that something that fits in well with what you're trying to do? I see head shaking no. And, so, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Haven't read that standard, have you? Yeah, I, I, I get a lot. Um, <laughs> we we get a lot of you know you know here's here's a new application coming in and you know there are two roles administrator and everything else so um, that's what we're defining and uh, we kind of just sit there and shake our heads and say it's got to be a little better than that <laughs> so. So it's tough in the world that's moving all about us, right? So we've got an increasing number of endpoints that we have perhaps no trust in, but varying levels of trust, right? right. Uh, we no longer can rely on owning a Wintel endpoint at the endpoint, right? Androids, uh, iOS, um, whatever RIM becomes, uh, Microsoft, and others, right? So we have this diversity of endpoints. We have the diversity of applications. Yeah. And ultimately, what does the ideal access controls, in a world where you don't control the endpoints, what sort of decisioning or authorization capabilities is the ideal solution? What, what would be the types of capabilities? We heard some of them mentioned there, you know, adaptive to certain things, but what are the types of things that you want to be able to do as the enterprise with that ideal system? I can, I can start us off. Um, you know, I'll tell you one thing that's a challenge right now, and maybe that'll highlight what we need to do better is that we've got tool silos all over the place, right? Um, so, you know, every enterprise is dealing with this and we've got to hire this guy to do DLP, this guy to do database access management. So when I think of ideal solutions, I really think of pulling this stuff together, centralizing it and consolidating it so that um, we can have some expression of policy, some similar taxonomy that makes sense across these multiple tools that can actually be consumed by them, right? And, you know, there are models out there. There's Acamo and things like that. But not, not a lot of enterprises have really built this internally in their four walls. I think mobile's putting a lot of pressure to, to improve those capabilities and come up and be more flexible to build those kinds of models. Um, but that's, that's a challenge that we deal with. I'm curious, um, you know, if other folks deal with that challenge. I would imagine that, you know, the tool silos aren't, aren't going away tomorrow and um, you know we talk about standards based and 
you know, I talk to the vendors and then they sit there and they roll their eyes. I'd say it'd really be great if, you know, you didn't have two policies, one in the cloud and one on-prem. Um, that really drives us crazy because now we have to actually, we have, we have to synchronize these two, right? Or three or four or five um, based on our policies that we, writ that, that we have put together. So it really creates a lot of challenges and quite frankly expenses in the organization because you're hiring for a specific function um, when really we're all trying to do the same thing. So those are my initial thoughts and pain points too around that. Good. Uh, I would say two things as well. Um, the first one is the ability to assert trust even in an untrusted device, an untrusted network. Um, and I know that's extremely hard, but um, I don't think enough um, intellectual energy, frankly, has been thrown at it. And um, if you look at it, the stupidity of the company aside, the RSA um, two-factor authentication with the uh, ACE server and the ID has still, frankly, won, you know, uh, worn well over time. Uh, but there's got to be better than that. Um, I just haven't seen it either out in the marketplace. Um, and the ones you do are really kind of tricky and foolish. You know, like there's a one where the phone calls. You, you get a call on your cell phone, if, you know. So you're going to accept someone's Android's getting a call back with a, a pin. They're going to put that pin back into the. I'm not trusting that. Um, so anyway, so we need a better way of asserting trust uh, at the end device. And number two, flexibility. I mean, we need to have, as you said before here, we need to have greater flexibility in how I determine, and it's going to be done relatively quickly, what I give this individual uh, access to based on certain attributes of their device, who they are, where they're at, what time of day it is, what environment they're in. Um, we don't have, I've never seen a capability like that. Um, if we had those two things, I might feel a little bit more comfortable about um, considering this one result. Dana? Yeah, I'm too big on breaking down the silo uh, um, problem. Um, so today we have a variety of different operating environments that we have to deal with. Those are operating systems, database management systems, uh, database management system applications, and so on. Um, each one of those operating environments support different data services. Each of those data services recognize different operations and, and object types. How do you comprehensively express and enforce policy that can be enforced over those, uh, those, those operating environments? Take, for example, um, uh, the, uh, having a, uh, a, a record and, and being able to uh, dis distribute that record through an email application, allowing someone to be able to open up that, that, that record and only being able to see the fields for which they're, 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 they're authorized for. So um, access control needs to be flexible in its ability to express a wide breadth of access control policies. It needs to be comprehensive across your, your, your data services. If you can achieve that, you should be able to authenticate one time into this, into this, um, into this operating environment and be able to see and consume all, your, all, your, uh, all, all the data. And you should only be able to access the data that, you, that, 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 you're, that you're authorized for. That comes pretty close to uh, an, an ideal um, access control environment to me. It's a pretty all-encompassing type thing, right? So I can, I can write a policy that's flexible, right? So the business decision makers and such can understand I've written policies at some level that cross a bunch of systems. I can adapt to the fact that I don't control endpoints in some variable way, right? So the context of how are you coming in, what device are you using, when are you coming in, what data are you using, what activities have you done in the past, arguably? It's agnostic, yeah. That it uses all that type of information that arguably the enterprise has access to already, right? And then at the same time uh, allows me to do this in a robust standards way. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an ideal. What's a baby step? What's a thing that I can start if I'm looking at an enterprise today? What's a use case or a set of data that I can use that allows me to take that baby step forward? Is there one that you guys have encountered or that's been useful before? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what is the use case that it uh, contained itself within? We implemented dynamic trust. I spoke on last year here. We are aiming for an ideal like that. The problem is not the flexibility of the access control system. The problem is how do you create a smooth, graceful failure and degradation of access? So before we can get to that step, baby steps, 
we started with just fundamentally defining specific applications being available at different levels of dynamically allocated trust and said this application will reside at this level of trust. When you achieve this level of trust, you will have access to the application. A different variation of the application may reside at a lower or higher level of trust. And so rather than having to make the applications gracefully degrade, we took the baby step of an application is statically defined, but your access is dynamically modified. I actually want to add one thing. That's a really good point. Um, one thing that I wanted to add to our discussion before is that what about the data, right? What about the systems and the data and actually um, spending the time to go through your your whole suite of systems and data and really start to classify. So, um, you know, if you don't have that in place, ideally down to every data element, down to every system identification, then you can't do anything else, right? So organizations really, really have to spend the time to define what those systems are and define what the data elements are. And then you can kind of marry the two together and I think you come up with a pretty nice ideal state. So the idea then is that you have some uh, fundamental idea as to what's important, what needs to be protected in a certain way. And then arguably you've instrumented some small set of apps, at least in the baby step, to use the information that's adaptively being processed, right, or, or assessed as to whether you have the ability to access that or not. So, you, so, you know, ultimately what we need to do is uh, identify some, some, uh, some fundamentals, so the lower underpinnings of access control and build it up from there. I think what we've been doing over the years is kind of making it up as we go along, coming mm -hmm. up with new models, new techniques. Um, really, if you think about it, um, the, the, regardless of the, of, regardless of what you access, the, the data that you can access fundamentally can only be read or written to. And then there's a, a wide variety of operations that you can implement through managing who can, or altering the state in which users can read and write data. And if you think about it, email does that. Workflow management does that. Um, database managements do that. Your corporate calendar does that. It enables people to read and write data and, and it enables you to, to alter the state or grant other people the ability to read and write data, regardless of the, of, the, of, the, of the type of data. So what we need to do is build from these fundamentals up, from, up to the top to achieve comprehensive protection across, across data services. And incidentally, if everything's made up of the same thing, things interoperate. So your, the data of data services naturally interoperate. Right now, what you can do is you have a, an, an operating system that protects data, and, and what you can do might protect a file. Nothing pre prevents you from copying that file, placing it into an email message, and sending it to whoever you want, or even including it as an attachment, including it in, because those access control mechanisms don't, know what he, don't, don't recognize each other. Right, but, but fundamentally, I, I'm still stuck. It still comes back to identity. <laughs> How, how do you still know, I mean, we have, we, even though you have an RBAC scheme or an adaptive scheme, those are all wonderful schemes, the true issue from my perspective is, who is that person? You know, who does that SID belong to, okay? Is that really the person who said they were, who asserted their identity when they logged on to the machine or passed whatever test it was that they passed to get on there? That's still the fundamental uh, challenge I think we still haven't uh, fully uh, solved. Um, I, I might be a little compulsive on, on, you know, on focusing on identity, but if you can't get that part right, I don't understand how you can um, make any ass assertions about what they're authorized to see or not see. Um, unless you say they're either, you know, I'll let this person log on to the system, but I have absolutely no trust in who they are. Well, why are you leaving them on log, you know, get them off of your system as fast as you can. Uh, when you start saying that they have levels of trust in the person, what did you do to make that happen? You know, what, what, what event was it that they passed? What test did they pass to, to, to enable to do that? So we, I, we have to focus just as much on that part of the problem as on the actual, uh, how we actually uh, authorize them to, to data or however we're going to do that. So I think, I think it's fair to say that a lot of times when we've built out systems in the past, it's been a pass or fail type capability, right? right. You were authenticated, you weren't authenticated. You were on the system, you weren't on the system. Um, is there a way that we have to start to think about, you know, we've talked about the adaptive nature of it, but we all know that getting the budget for something, dealing with users, dealing even with the graceful degradation of whatever activity they're going to be able to see or access, turns into a discussion with humans. What is it that we've learned, hopefully learned from past activities? How do we go about talking through folks and telling them, hey, the system will behave differently under certain conditions. Is that, 
Is that a new way of thinking about security for us and them? Well, um, hmm. um, you know, I think that for us to have successful discussions, we have to talk about it in terms of business enablement, right? So it's not so much about the details of the technology and graceful degradation. Um, most of the folks in our enterprise want to know what are they going to get out of it. They don't, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, getting kicked out of the office when you start talking about, you know, techno babble and Zacamole and all this kind of stuff. Um, so to me, it comes really, really, but the discussions come back to business enablement. So what am I going to actually get out of this? And so those discussions have to be strategically focused. Um, you know, one thing that I'm big on is that, you know, this is a complex world. And if there's not a champion in the organization to carry a strategy through from start to finish for however long it takes, um, then, you know, it has a tendency to fall apart because it's complex. It's too hard. Um, it's too hard to figure out what that app's doing. It's too many roles. It's too complex. It's going to take too long. Um, but if you start putting it in terms of enablement with things like mobile, well, you know what? I can get you that shiny new device and I can get you onto this application. You want to see that stuff on your iPhone, right? And let me tell you, you know, the executives kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely want to see that. Um, so, you know, if you start with kind of those carrots, um, I, I've had success in our company in doing that and bringing in the right tools and technologies to solve some of these problems, but it's got to be followed through. Um, and, and it has to be documented. We can talk all day about this, but if you don't put anything down on paper and have those discussions strategically, um, then, you know, you'll get kicked out of the office, essentially. I think the, the other hard part about that, Mark, is what, uh, reference to what you mentioned, is today we actually let people have access to almost most sensitive information in the corporations and in the government based on what? Based upon the fact that they logged on, they passed their credential, they have a PKI cert perhaps, and that's it. I'm not sure how you take that away. Take away the, the, well, the perception saying, that they should saying, be able to access you're saying, it? Right. You're saying to do less. Well, they, that, that's how it works today. Frank, there is, there is no additional test I know of to get the access to the country's uh, greatest secrets or the corporate secret sauce in the, in the company. It's based on you pass an ID test, largely a password, maybe a few other uh, uh, capabilities. You've got a PKI cert perhaps, and you're in. Uh, I don't know how we go back and say, uh, well, we're going to change that. And um, either we're going to have more tests for you to pass, they're going to love hearing that, or you're just not going to see as much data as you used to see. I, you know, I don't know how you put that toothpaste back in the tube there. Um, does, mobile off, does mobile offer an opportunity there? Is it redefining well, think, enough I think, that... I think we gave up on mobile already. I mean, frankly, uh, most of the uh, MDM platforms, you're, again, it's about you're either in, you're in, fine, here's the app for you. Um, or you're not in. You're, I don't understand. I don't think there's degrees of in or, or degrees of out. I, I just want to add one thing. I mean, in terms of changing behaviors, um, we were talking about this earlier too, which is, um, you know, I get calls a lot from my bank now if I'm traveling or there's something weird about the transaction. I think making those analogies to folks within your enterprise, you know what, um, it's the reality, right? So um, it's not abnormal for me. It might bug me a little bit, but it's not abnormal for me to get a call. I mean, I actually got one where I had to walk through five or six transactions, I was waiting to get on a plane, and it was just, did you do this, did you do that, did you do that? That was a little exhaustive, I wouldn't take it that far. But in terms of changing the behavioral model, I mean, I mean, this is what's happening, right? It's not, it's not just about who I am, it's about who I am and what I'm accessing. So I feel like that credential is good to say, you know, I'm Craig, but am I still Craig, am I still Craig, am I still Craig along the way? Um, hopefully the tolerance levels um, are, are becoming more acceptable for those types of things. So we talk about BYOD. You know, BYOD is something that gets thrown out a lot. Uh, some people think it's the future. Some people think it's crazy. Uh, it may be both for all we know. But, um, but our consumers and all of our users are consumers at some level, right? And they're being trained by other people in what to expect and not expect. Should, is there an advantage there to take it? to take care of? If, if the banks and the, and the credit card guys and everybody else is watching somebody in a different way, is there an advantage that the enterprise should play off of as well? And why, how many enterprises take the trouble of saying, hey, you know, I noticed that you logged in from three different entries in the past day and I, I'm suspicious, you know, is it really you? And ask that question versus just continue to allow the access or not. Yeah, I'm actually surprised some of the companies who are in the authorization business haven't taken that lesson and modified their products or, or made the, that jump that, uh, frankly, the banks 
even some of the lesser banks have made to ensure that those people performing those transactions are indeed that person. Uh, there's, a, there's a real gap, a real gulf there. And um, again, as I said before, here we are 20 odd years later, and if you think about it, the foundation for almost all identity is Microsoft SIDS and your membership in an active directory. There's a lot of things that go on after that. You get SAML and exactly. I mean, there's always of expressing that. But if you go back to where it began with, it began with you behind sitting behind a client workstation. Um, we sh everything else has done better in the last 27 years. This is one area that is, is the more abundant. It hasn't. Anywhere. So if you look at some of the banks, I mean, there's some argument that the banks don't do anything unless their auditors tell them to, right? So the American auditors, uh, or I should say the regulators, basically laid down requirements that said uh, you have to do a risk analysis, you have to do something other than passwords. And that's when we all started to see this, you know, you're logging in from a computer that it, I don't normally see you from, answer these questions. The EU regulators have literally told the European banks, you are not allowed to trust the endpoints figure out how to deal with security. Is there some element of enterprises or oversight that says, you know, we should be doing things? The Americans have secondarily, even two years ago, issued guidance to the banks that said you have to watch behavior. Online banking activities, you have to watch behavior. Is there an element that says that enterprises should lay down similar policies or requirements? I, I would strongly support them, but I don't know where the Office of Computer Security Standards in the U.S. <laughs> government is at these days. So, uh, well, it's uh, uh, well, maybe it's a mist. Yeah. Well, there there, there is a a, a a guidance on um, remote authentication, 863, and they tried to look at this problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know within the within the federal government, based on the sensitivity of the data. You have to comply with different levels of uh, of, of, of rigor in that in that that that, that, that authentication scheme. So there there are um, there are there is guidance in place. I would suggest that people take a look at 800, 863. I'm not a, an, an expert in that in, in that area, but there is uh, there is some uh, um, some guidance. I'd like to pick up on something that you were mentioned earlier, but where um, people um, authenticate themselves and they they're they, they're given a, a, a a, a huge volume of data, and uh, you can't just take that away. It may be more data than they need to have access to, and you just can't data do it because they can't perform the job. One of the one of the founding principles of, of of access control is least privilege. You should only be able to have access to the information that's necessary to perform your 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 job. All the other data is not, even though it may not be a bad thing to have access to, it, it could eventually do harm. That's really where policy comes into place. You need to be able to access information in accordance with, uh, with, in, in accordance with, with, with policy. One of the problems is, is that access control mechanisms are very weak in their ability to express and enforce, uh, and, and, um, and, and enforce policy. Yeah, and I'm sure some, there are some out here, but if you've ever been an AD administrator for more than 100 people trying to figure out multiple combinations of groups given a certain object of data, you can make yourself absolutely crazy, and uh, a number of us have actually <laughs> made ourselves crazy. Um, it, it's, it's very hard to do. It's really hard. Yeah, I understand least privilege very, very well, but believe me, in practice, uh, it's a lot harder to do than it is. And, and, and getting it wrong has a big cost as well, by the way, if you're overly conservative, than getting it, uh, making it too liberal. So it, it's, there are not tools that allow you to do this um, easily. That's, that's a, another problem. So, David, you mentioned the idea of writing policies and the idea of making them. Yeah, writing down a policy and, and implementing are two different are two different things. It's often the case that even uh, I know at, at NIST, it's uh, so, so someone who does research in the area of access control and sees what is possible and then sees the actual the state of the practice. Um, you know, just let me go just go take a, a step back. Access control is, is, is hard, and we've been working on it literally for 40 years. And probably of all the disciplines of security, access control is probably the least mature today. Um, so um, that being said, it's still we're in this, in this mode where you're told, don't put sensitive data on memory sticks. Don't take sensitive information and, and put it and, and share it through your, through, um, through, through your email. Those are procedures that break down. The very people who have the mot mot are motivated to violate those policies are the same people you're saying don't do it to. So you can't rely on those things. And access control policies 
um, need to be able to be um, flexibly expressed, flexibly um, um, in, enforced, and they should be comprehensively, they should be comprehensively enforced. And I don't believe it's in, impossible to do. I think it's, it is, it is possible. Um, it's, uh, it's, it'll take a little while before, so from a theoretical perspective, in a laboratory we could demonstrate these things, but to actually deploy it and have it be in widespread use is going to be an uphill battle. Takes work, right? Takes, takes people takes being involved in different communities looking at it. So what is some of the work you've been doing on the policy machine in this, in this regard and sort of helping people yeah, so get a foothold? Uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was a big part of role-based access control. I really do believe that was a step forward. Um, um, but over the years, we've seen that there's been various flavors of, of role-based access control. There's been ABAC, there's been the, the, the policy model du jour keeps coming out. And what we tried to do is take a step back and identify the fundamental underpinnings of access control and build what, was, what you could think of as a, as a general purpose access control mechanism. We refer to that as, the, as, the, as the, um, the policy machine. As we've been doing that research, we've identified a number of uh, data elements and relations that are capable of expressing a very wide breadth of access control policies. As we've been conducting our research, those numbers of elements and re relations have only gotten smaller and uh, the, the policy machine's power in expressing enforcing policies gotten larger. We've also noticed that, as I mentioned before, that data can only fundamentally be read and many operations can be implemented as read, write, or change in a state in which users can read and write data. That's send. Um, so there's a wide variety of data services. So the policy machine is an access control framework that, that's uh, capable of expressing a rich set of access control policies and capable of expressing a wide breadth of data services to include email, workflow, database management, enforcing policy comprehensively across those uh, across those uh, those those uh, those data services and it works in one operating environment so there's just one operating environment you just authenticate yourself into that operating environment and you instantaneously can see your files your 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 email your work items and so on so this is the type of thing though that you're now outsource uh, open sourcing is that correct with the yeah, NIST? so what we've done is as I mentioned before we don't just write papers we develop formal models we run tools against those models to make sure they're internally consistent um, we develop reference implementations and what we have now is we have a, a reference implementation of the policy machine and it's kind of like in a cloud-like in, in, in environment and uh, this spring we're going to um, offer that 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 software up as a, an, an as an open as an open source solution. That's great, and you've already got a website online under the NIST site for the policy machine for folks who want right. to start looking at the papers right. that have been written and some of the background. Have you posted it up on GitHub yet? The actual code? Not yet. We're we're still in the process of working on our minimum viable um, product, and we think that's going to be available in the um, in the spring. We hope that other people will be inspired by the policy machine and what its capabilities are. Um, we have our own applications that we that we've developed. We're hoping other people will will make those better or develop new applications. And again, it, it works comprehensively. So again, if you uh, um, cut a, cut a, a field out of a, a out of a record, paste it into an email, and, and email that to to 12 different people. Um, if they're not able to see, read that field of that record, they're not going to be able to to to, to uh, read the um, read the read the, uh, um, the the message. Cool. So I know uh, we're looking for a lot of folks here. If you've got interest in the access control stuff and capabilities, basically the sort of start looking at the open source opportunity that NIST is bringing to bear here and. And sort of jump on and Mark, can and I just say one more sure. thing? Not, not necessarily about the policy machine, but um, access control doesn't only pertain to users. Really, users don't access information; processes do, and processes um, and what you are, are, are processes access data based on the privileges of a user. But um, and that's that's why processes are are vulnerable to Trojan horse attacks and be, is because they can do things that the user can do and the user doesn't even um, d doesn't even know it so what we need to do is you need to to uh, consider not only the user you need to consider the the the, the, um, 
the process itself. For example, if a process reads top secret information, that process, not necessarily the user, the process should only be able to write to, say, a top secret container. Um, and what you're able to do with that is enforce a wide breadth of, uh, of confinement pol policies, not only mandatory access control, but things like only doctors can read medical information. So what you should be able to do is say only doctors can read medical information, and either through a Trojan horse, forwarding an email, copying and pasting, that information shouldn't be able to be leaked to anybody who's not a, who's not a doctor. So process, doing access control down to the process level is also very important. There's an awful lot to do though, right? I mean, we've already heard that, you know, it's about the enterprise understanding the sensitivities of different types of data, knowing what assets they have, having to deal with untrusted devices, and a bunch of them, right? So, uh, what are some of the untrust? I mean, we hear about the Internet of Things. We've got mobile devices already here. At some point, BMWs are already reading emails, calendars, and doing things, thermostats, clock radios around the corner. Pacemakers. Pacemakers, yeah. All, all of these things want to access capabilities and technologies. Extending that concept out that way really depends on having a vision for it, right? In fact, the pacemaker, now I think of it, the pacemaker is probably the thing I would probably trust most because, I mean, what's the chance someone else is going to take it out of their body, you know? It's probably got great authentication capability. Um, well, you're hoping it does. I hope it does. So, so we, um, you know, I can uh, comment on some of that, too, is, um, you know, we've got a world uh, changing in the utility landscape um, when it comes to smart devices, um, you know, uh, you know Eventually, we'll see thousands and thousands of smart devices controlling um, things like power. Um, and we are in a place where we've got to be strategic. Um, we've got to communicate not just across um, um, uh, you know, physical and, and, and logical space, but we have to actually talk about um, converging operational technologies and information technologies. And we need to have those conversations. And, and we're um, you know, we're starting to have really, really good conversations where, where we weren't, where IT wasn't really welcome at the door. Um, we have a bigger seat at the table right now with our, with our operational guys. Because um, a lot of these new um, devices that, that are being developed, um, they have capabilities, right? They have capabilities that, that you know, just like a pacemaker would that, um, you know, has a kernel. Um, and so, you know, we spend time really um, trying to put this framework together to ensure that um, we're meeting those demands. And that's about ensuring you know, safety and security in the supply chain, all these kinds of things that you have to get in front of um, to ensure the integrity and the security. Uh, for us, I mean, it's, uh, it's critical infrastructure. Um, so it's pretty important. Make it work, make it work all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is one of the differences between a lot of other things we've done in the past, whether it was GRC or SIM or something else, right? Access control is in line. Right? Yes or no? Yes, no, or something else? Wow. True? Um, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> it, it's How's absolutely. It work? How's it work on the other way? What? Well, well here's, here's what's interesting. I think of this one as, as really um, preventative and detective controls. And, you know, there aren't a ton of enterprises out there that actually deploy their technologies in prevent mode. Um, which I think would be the definition of an access control, right? You don't allow it to happen in the first place. Uh, instead, you rely on your SIM. Uh, so you go into some kind of detective mode. You push data out to your SIM. Your SIM's got to be quick enough, nimble enough to actually respond. So detect and respond is really important, right? But how quickly can you do it? And is that really an access control? Well, it's after the fact. No, they're already in the front door, so you haven't really prevented access. Um, it, you know, it helps, um, but I feel like um, part of the reason that we don't put these things out there in prevent mode is because there's, you know, in most enterprises, there's, there's not a large tolerance for disruption. And this goes back to spending the time to actually define these policies in the way that make them effective um, so that you can have that confidence level to actually deploy these things in a prevent mode. Um, you know, you can be super quick and nimble and detect and respond, um, but when we get to a point where we've got to prevent, um, you know, we've got to go into prevention mode. So, um, you know, I think that having the right policies in place to be able to do that um, are, you know, it's going to increase um, how we protect our environments, for sure. Uh, the other thing I'd add, Mark, you ask a, a great question uh, about what are the baby steps? You know, what are, what are things we can actually do now? Um, I'm not so sure how much us as you know, customers, uh, consumers of these services can actually do. 
I think it really, we need to have a better cooperation and a new way of thinking between uh, vendors, uh, both software, hardware, uh, operating system, um, and the government um, to work together to really focus more on, and I know Howard uh, Schmidt tried to do this a lot when he was uh, in his role at uh, cyber security czar, is to focus more on how do we really uh, work the trust issue, right? You know, how, wh what are the fundamental things we have to do in all our systems uh, to ensure some high level of trust uh, in the identity of the, of the uh, individual. Once you do that, it's not that the rest is going to be easy, but I think there is a, um, you can see a, a solution. You can see a way out of the, out of the tunnel, right? Um, but that, from my perspective, has to be the starting point, because whether you use um, a, a, a model or a, what do you call it, the policy engine? Policy machine. Policy machine. Uh, or are back, it still comes back to the sense that you have to, at some point, say yes or no, I'm going to allow this person to have access to this object. And that, from my perspective, seems a part we have to early work. And those are the baby steps um, I, I would recommend, is, is focusing more on the trust first. So establishing a capability of trust, being adaptive and watching what's going on, being able to write policies that decision makers in the enterprise understand, being able to gracefully degrade capabilities, uh, which arguably a capability under the covers like policy, policy machine might start to let you get to. So I, I want to add one thing here, too, and that's sort of the flip side to this, is that, is that when you don't provide that flexibility, I, I just go back to business enablement, is that um, you don't allow your business to do certain things. And um, the, the continued pressure of mobile, um, you know, you can be super conservative. And I see that, you know, lots of large enterprises have built, you know, great walls and protections. Um, but but we, 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 you know, we have to answer these questions. We've got to provide more nimble access. The world is changing, so the culture is changing. We can't continue to just um, remain in our um, you know, four walls, um, even though you know, even if it's a fortress and it's, and it's um, you know, big and you know, has, you know, it's nine, nine feet of concrete, we still have to um, address this nimble type of access that's occurring right now to, to enable the business to, to do what they need to do. Awesome. So I'll open it up for questions if there are any from the audience, folks who want to ask about some of the experience some folks have had or some of the... Uh, or have solutions. Or have solutions. <laughs> uh, I'll start right here. Uh, I came here because I'm hoping to, to, to learn more things about strategy because I have a real strategic problem. Um, collecting data is in and of itself my biggest vulnerability. I, I work at Silent Circle. We're trying to pr produce products that protect people's uh, privacy. The best way to protect somebody's privacy is to not have the information. <laughs> if I don't have it, I'm not vulnerable. And, and, and then there's all this, how do I control access to it? But it, it causes me no end of problems because my developers would like to log things so that they can debug the product. Um, the IDS wants to know who's attacking us. And, but every piece of information I have is a risk because I'm trying to protect privacy. And before I came here, I never thought about that as a risk. I mean, you know, in, in any company before, so oh, welcome to our hill. It's like, no, more information, more information. You know, I'm a big picture guy. I can hold hideous quantities of information in my head, and I always thought that was a good thing. And now it's, no, any information I have, somebody could get it. So to repeat, and I know that uh, because of the recording and some folks online, so the question is, uh, the sheer act of collecting information that you might potentially use to be adaptive and be contextual and make real-time decisions on, potentially violate or undermine the privacy that many of us value. Uh, and so how do you wrestle with the fact that you want to enable the capabilities for one side, but the other side has a competing goal uh, or interest. And it's hard, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, I don't have the answer. I mean, it's, I, yeah. you have the answer? You know, <laughs> um, no, this is the magic wand here. Um, you know, if every piece of data could somehow identify itself, wake up, call home, talk about its sensitivity, talk about, you know, where it is, where it lives, what it's doing. Um, Obscure itself when necessary. You know, that would be great. Um, <laughs> Still, but, still but looking for those. I, I, I do think there is a, uh, at least a separation of certain problem sets. And something that I know that we give a lot of thought to is there are certain times where the asset being protected and the infrastructure collecting the information is 
is sort of, you're touching my asset, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> I have a right to know that. And, uh, and it's, I'm protecting my asset. And so in that regards, when you come to me, there's an awareness that you're interacting with me. As opposed to watching a consumer who's out there, and this is, I do think, one of the BYOD challenges is, BYOD in some ways, when enterprises want to put an agent on the device, very often, very normal, very sane people say, I don't want my employer watching me. Mm -hmm. And so how do you set up a system that effectively doesn't have an agent on the endpoint, and doesn't trust the endpoint as much, but is watching when it interacts with them? And is that enough? And that's sort of, I think, part of the risk management question for the enterprise, I think. But. No, this doesn't directly address your question because that, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, you know, I think one of the themes here is access control is really hard. I, 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 really, <laughs> yeah. I, I really believe that. Glad you came but one thing I will that. say is that um, people should be able to, to uh, share data, but you should be the owner of that data. You should be able to stipulate the policies under which your data can be, can be, can be accessed. So access control almost by definition is a federated problem. Different, different entities should be able to uh, uh, um, publish their data, establish the attributes, establish the access control policies, and those need to be honored by, uh, by other organizations. I think it's a completely legitimate question, and yeah. I, 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 particularly in the consumer side of the world, I think it's a very big question. I hate, I hate to sound like a bureaucrat, but this does speak to standards. You know, this is something where industry and the government need to sit down and come to some agreement on what can be collected, how it can be collected, and what's the way to secure it. And uh, that would be a big help if they, can, if they would do that. And, and of course, there's the one flaw in that is that I'm out to protect my customers' privacy, and some of them are concerned about yeah. those entities that are passing those standards right. Right. being the ones that sure. are collecting uh, what they don't want collected. Absolutely. You, you know, one other characteristic that's also Some very democracies important. are health. At the, at one of the underpinnings of, of privacy is being able to determine who has access to your, 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 yeah. your data. So it's often the question, who has access to my medical record? But if that, it's, it's uh, again, um, read access is very, is very um, transitive. Write access isn't transitive, but it's, it's almost impossible to determine who has access to your data. No system can give you any confidence, can tell you with confidence, that they know who has access to your data, unless you can do confinement. All right, so we're given, being given the hook, and I hope that uh, this was useful. I want to encourage uh, folks to talk to the panelists who will be here the rest of the conference and get involved with the policy machine. There's a question uh, there. And, uh, I'm sorry? I think there's a question there. Uh, we don't have, I'm sorry, they're we're dragging us. <laughs> I think we have to get off the stage is what I'm doing. Oh, all right. <laughs> they're throwing us out. Yeah, we're out of time. All right. Okay. So, so thanks for everyone. And, uh,